those who are not familiar about Alberta's industrial heartland, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about our the region and our association. So the association, Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association, it's a collaborative 22-year partnership of five municipalities and three associate members. So the city of Fort Saskatchewan, city of Edmonton, Strathcona County, Sturgeon County, and Lamont County are the uh, members of Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association, and we have three associate members, the towns of Gibbons, Redwater, and Bruderheim. And, you know, this association was formed, as it mentions here, 22 years ago. The main purpose of what we do is primarily to um, attract investment to this region, uh, encourage responsible economic development and business development in the region to help build up the heavy industrial uh, cluster that is here that takes advantage of all the competitive advantages that we have here. So how our association is organized, we are organized into sort of a few distinct areas. The first and foremost is business development, where our team will focus on investor outreach, investor awareness and hosting, business case development. In essence, we are marketing the industrial heartland around the globe, working with companies to help them figure out if their next capital investment makes sense in our jurisdiction. You know, companies, large scale companies, when they're looking at their next major um, investment, you know, into a value add energy project or a multi billion dollar facility, they look at multiple jurisdictions around the world, considering all sorts of factors, capital, feedstock, uh, country risk, um, labor, all sorts of things. And so when they're looking at our jurisdiction, we want to help them understand our region, get the information as quickly as possible so they can make the appropriate assessments and figure out if their projects, project makes sense here. And so that's a big part of what we do. We also have a team uh, involved in government relations working primarily around provincial and federal advocacy. Um, what this team is doing is, is helping uh, members, both elected and, and uh, the bureaucracy in the uh, federal and provincial governments, helping them understand what's going on in the industrial heartland, helping them shape policy, ultimately with the intent to improve the competitiveness and the region to encourage additional investment into our region. We also have um, somebody focused on communications and community relations. The idea is to ensure that we continue to have support of our community for continued investment in our region. And we have a focus and an, a, a, and a, an effort to continue to improve the infrastructure in our region. So Alberta's industrial heartland, uh, it is an economic engine for the region, for the province and for the country. Um, over $40 billion of assets have been invested here. You can see from this map here, here's the five municipalities that we talked about, and the industrial heartland sits on 582 square kilometers in the northeast corner here of the Edmonton metropolitan region. The annual spend regionally is around $2.8 billion, and the amount of jobs, a tremendous amount of high-paying jobs in the region from the companies that are operating in Alberta's industrial heartland. Um, so... We are Canada's largest hydrocarbon processing region and definitely an economic engine for the province and for the country. So the, the industry that's existing here right now, um, again, over $40 billion, uh, close to 45, actually approaching 45 billion, consists of a number of different companies and operations out here. Um, you know, I'll start um, really with, you know, we have the, the, the bitumen upgrading and refining operations that people would be very familiar with. Um, when we have our midstream operations, so an, a, a number of fractionation facilities that would take natural gas uh, liquid stream and, and fractionate it into specifically uh, propane, ethane, propane, butane, the specific components of natural gas and natural gas liquids. There's significant storage capability out here with the salt caverns, um, water and industrial gas systems, CO2 capture and pipelines, a lot of midstream and utilities infrastructure that really adds value to the region. And then all of the downstream gas and natural gas liquids processing that's in the region. So this would be your petrochemical space, typically. Production of ethylene and polyethylene, um, production of uh, propylene, monoethylene glycol, ethylene oxide, ethylene glycol, isooctane, styrene monomer. So a number of base chemicals and fertilizers, urea, ammonium sulfate, ammonia, 
all of these type of facilities here in the industrial heartland um, are taking advantage of the availability and low cost nature of the feedstocks that are available here. The companies that operate in this region, here's a snapshot of them. You would recognize them. They're world-class companies, uh, good corporate citizens, and, and uh, really contribute to the cluster and the cluster benefits that we have here. And some of the recent uh, projects that we've seen here in the industrial heartland, um, ATCO has a hydrogen blending project underway. Wolf Midstream recently completed the Alberta carbon trunk line. Inner pipeline is constructing their propane to polypropylene facility. Dow is in the final stages of their ethylene plant expansion. Um, and uh, Candu Rail completed their 302 acre rail yard, Sturgeon Rail facility. This was operational in September, 2020. So what I, the main thing I want to talk to you about here is, is the strengths and the competitive advantages of a region, why companies uh, would choose to come to Alberta's industrial heartland versus other jurisdictions in the world. And, you know, the main, the main competitive advantage for companies coming here is the affordable and abundant natural gas and natural gas liquids resources that are here. Um, you know, right now, well, so the industrial heartland is sitting, of course, in the center of the province. We have access to these world-class resources, the Montney, the Duvernay. Right now, there's over 200 years of supply of natural gas at current production in, in these deposits. You know, so decades and decades and decades of feedstock supply, well over 100 years of propane um, at current production. And so the main point of this slide is we have close proximity to, you know, decades and you know, in case of natural gas, centuries of feedstock that is available in our jurisdiction. So there is longevity with the resource that's here. And this is some of the lowest cost feedstock in the world and the lowest cost feedstock in North America. And I just want to show you this graph here for a moment. So the blue line is Henry Hub price. So this is Gulf Coast pricing for natural gas. The red line is Alberta pricing for natural gas. And you can see there's continuously a discount associated with natural gas here in Alberta relative to Gulf Coast. Gulf Coast is where the market is made. Um, given the amount of um, natural gas, wet gas in particular, drilling that's happening in order to access condensate that would go to the oil sands to help with the, the, the uh, production of dilbit or the diluted bitumen, that results in a significant amount of surplus methane, ethane, propane, butane, et cetera, that is priced such that it's priced at Gulf Coast pricing, less transportation typically is what your long-term pricing is gonna be because we have a surplus of those components here. And therefore we have a structural advantage with respect to the competitive nature of the feedstocks here. So if a company is looking to build a plant that takes, let's say propane and is gonna upgrade that to polypropylene, and they look at building that plant in the Gulf Coast versus building that plant here, they would have a tremendous uh, price advantage associated with building here. Here's just a snapshot. It's just one day. Every day is different, of course, but this is North American pricing for natural gas. And you can see on this day, this point in time, you know, $1.37 for natural gas. This would have been probably nine months ago or so, um, you know, versus $1.94 on Gulf Coast. $1.93 over on the East Coast. Um, you know, so the best pricing in North America on this day was here in Alberta, and we've seen that uh, over and over again. And the same, oh, this is just the pricing forecast going forward. We would expect, again, the long-term pricing is going to be the Gulf Coast price, less transportation, um, and we are expecting to see a long-term discount on natural gas here in Alberta versus uh, the Gulf Coast, and that's our main competing region. And it's the same story on propane. So here's the same story on propane. So you've got Mount Bellevue pricing um, in the Gulf Coast versus Edmonton pricing. And you've got a tremendous structural advantage here on propane pricing. And that, you know, similar sort of forecast going forward. The X, you know, the marginal barrel of propane being produced in the area needs to move to the United States by rail. And so the price you get in the United States, less transportation cost is what the pricing is going to be here in Alberta. And that is the competitive advantage for a company to build their facility here 
and upgrade their products to a value add pro product, for example, propane going to polypropylene. This is the competitive advantage for companies doing that in our region. Another competitive advantage is these world-class salt formations for salt cavern storage. This is potential underground for hydrogen as well as other products, uh, natural gas and natural gas liquids derivatives. So underneath the ground, about 1.8 kilometers below the surface, there's a Lotsburg salt formation. What companies have been successful in doing for decades and have become obviously experts in this is, you know, you drill into the salt formation, you inject water, dissolve the salt and pump the brine to the surface and you're left with brine ponds on the surface. What's left is a massive impermeable structure that is, is can typically hold about a million barrels and it is a very capital efficient way to have storage for your um, petrochemical products or your, your hydrocarbon products. So it is a very capital efficient and it is a competitive advantage for our region. Some other regions uh, have this, but not all. And so it is a, definitely an advantage for us here. Another advantage is the infrastructure that's been put in place and with specific to carbon capture, utilization and storage. So of the 700 oil refining complexes worldwide, the industrial heartland is home to two of the world's three carbon capture refinery complexes. And we're home to one of the world's three carbon capture fertilizer facilities. So we have the world's largest CO2 pipeline, which is the Wolf Midstream ACTL, Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, taking CO2 from the industrial heartland down into the Lacombe region. And Shell Quest Projects takes uh, CO2 from the um, Scottford facility and stores that, sequesters that underground as well. And so this infrastructure, in particular, the ACTL infrastructure has surplus capacity. It was built uh, for about 14.7 million uh, tons a year, I believe, of CO2. It's, it's taking now in the order of 10%. And so there's surplus capacity for CO2. So as companies are looking at their next investment around the world, when there's already carbon capture utilization and storage infrastructure in the region, it is a tremendous competitive advantage for us. And so that, that has a number of you know, pylon effects as well. Not only is there the advantage from an investor to be able to access CCUS infrastructure, then it creates, it starts to create lower cost production in this or lower carbon production in this region, um, opportunities for low carbon hydrogen production. That in turn brings interest for other investors who want to access those products, et cetera. So it, it really is, uh, starts to build a very strong value proposition for the industrial heartland. The combination of low cost feedstock and the opportunity for low carbon production given the CCUS capability in the region. And so what does that lead for us with respect to growth going forward? So one thing I wanna emphasize for everybody on the call here is, you know, petrochemical demand in the world typically grows above GDP growth annually. So if, if the globe is growing, the GDP for the world is growing two to 3%, you'd see a, a growth of petrochemical demand above that on an annual basis. And so if you just look out to 2030, even, you know, just, uh, this is petrochemical demand in North America, I believe, between 2019 and, and 2030, you're seeing a 44% increase in demand growth for petrochemicals in North America. So, what, what that means is that companies who are in this business are continuously looking for their next project, where to invest their next project to provide the supply that is going to meet this growing demand. And so we believe there is a strong demand case for petrochemicals going forward. And we believe the industrial heartland is a good location for these investments. And so we think the future looks bright from a standpoint, from a demand standpoint for uh, the types of products that are produced here. And so that leads to a number of opportunities to meet the petrochemical growth. Uh, so methanol and fertilizers, which would typically be produced from methane um, in natural gas. Again, given the low cost advantage, there's opportunities that we're seeing and we're talking to companies on these types of investments. For ethane, going from ethane through to ethylene or polyethylene, there's, there's opportunities for investments here. Again, based on the low cost uh, availability of ethane in Alberta. 
propane through to polypropylene. This is based on the low cost availability of propane. And then all specialty chemicals opportunities, other diversification opportunities that would be leveraging the infrastructure and the cluster benefits of the region. And then finally, hydrogen. There's lots of uh, excitement around hydrogen these days. And the, the excitement around hydrogen is driven by that low cost methane and the carbon capture utilization and storage that's in our region. To talk specifically about hydrogen, this is a very busy slide. There's a study back in 2018 of a whole number of different jurisdictions that would produce hydrogen. And here's cost on the, on the, on the x-axis here. And a number of countries have very expensive green hydrogen. And then all the way down here, uh, Russia and, and Canada, and this would be Alberta. So some of the lowest cost natural gas with carbon capture and storage available here in Alberta. And so this positions us very well globally for uh, participating in the hydrogen economy and really um, puts hydrogen as a potential economic opportunity uh, in our region, both, both regionally and potentially for, potentially for exports. And then there's a whole conversation around creating a hydrogen economy. So right now, uh, with a number of, uh, uh, you know, hydrogen produced in this region, moving forward to where you have blue hydrogen, where you capture the CO2, and the blue hydrogen would be utilized in a number of industrial feedstocks and industrial processes. Then as the country develops, other jurisdictions would be looking at producing green hydrogen, which is produced using renewable electricity and water and all this into a hydrogen economy, a series of hydrogen hubs being looked at across the country. And uh, Alberta's Industrial Heartland is participating in the Edmonton uh, Region Hydrogen Hub that was announced uh, a few weeks ago. And we had a conversation about that a few weeks ago here uh, with Associate Minister Nelly. And there is a growing overseas hydrogen market. Um, perhaps not necessarily for hydrogen. It is possible that there's a market for ammonia or liquid organic hydrogen carriers. We had a we hosted a webinar with Japan um, about a month and a half ago, um, and Japan's looking to import about 30 million tons a year by 2050 of ammonia, and they would use ammonia to supplement their coal-fired power generation to offset the uh, or to reduce the carbon uh, dioxide that is put into the air in Japan. And that is a huge amount of ammonia. To put that into context, that's larger than the total ammonia production currently in all of North America. So there will be a demand pull for these products. And, and we think we're well positioned given our proximity to the coast to export to Asian markets. And this slide demonstrates that. So Alberta's industrial heartland, rail access to the West Coast, and then 12 days over into Asian markets, which is you know half the transit time versus coming out of the Gulf Coast. So for companies who want to look to access markets in Asia, this is not a bad location for them, giving proximity to the coast and then transit time into Asia. So uh, lots of interest and in excitement around the hydrogen economy, of which we are well positioned. And then finally, I just want to make a couple of points around government support for the types of investments that would come here in Alberta's industrial heartland. The first here is the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program. This was announced um, in 2020. The details came out in the fourth quarter of 2020. This is a 10-year open program. It's feedstock agnostic, and it will it, it is supporting uh, investments that are over $50 million that are going to upgrade um, Alberta's natural resources, either uh, methane, ethane, or propane, and upgrade those to value-add products. And if a company comes and does that, when they get their facility up and running, the uh, government of Alberta will provide them with a series of grants that would be equivalent to about 12% of the eligible capital costs, which probably work out to about 10% of the total capex of the facility. So a, a very strong support uh, incentive from the government of Alberta, we think will help make a difference for investors coming to our region. And then uh, to supplement that, the Municipalities in Alberta's industrial heartland have uh, looked at a, a policy that would look at uh, tax exemptions in the order of between one and two and a half percent of total capital on uh, municipal taxes. And this complements nicely the APIP program from the provincial government to provide a, a very strong um, support from the municipal and provincial governments to uh, attract investments to 
our jurisdiction. So you combine all of this from the low cost feedstock to the infrastructure that's here to the government supports. Um, and I didn't even talk about the, you know, the abundance of skilled labor here, um, the support, uh, of course, from the polytechniques and the, the U of A and other post-secondary educational institutions that are here. All of this adds a very strong value proposition, which we think positions Alberta's industrial heartland very nicely for uh, additional value add investments for our region. So with that, I will try to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Um, and if someone could give me some assistance on that, then I'll be able to stop sharing my screen. Oh, there it is, stop share. There we go, does that, uh, stop sharing now, correct? Yeah. So I'm happy to have a conversation. That was a fairly quick uh, 20 minutes and, and uh, happy to have a, have a dialogue here. Awesome, Thank, th thanks Mark. That was very informative um, in your presentation on the Alberta's heartland. Uh, I've I've heard you speak a couple times now, and uh, definitely exciting times for our province. Uh, at this time, we'd like to move into the Q&A portion of today's session. We did receive some questions uh, prior to today, um, but if anybody wants to add some questions into the into the chat box, Alan will be uh, will be monitoring those. Uh, so the the, the first pre-submitted question pre-submitted question is, is is are there any overarching opportunities created through investments and employment opportunities other than hydrogen? Well, yes, absolutely. So um, on, on one of the slides that I've shown there, uh, I know there's lots of conversation and dialogue around hydrogen right now, but um, given the low cost nature of methane, ethane, and propane in particular, those three feedstocks for various petrochemical investments, yeah, the opportunities to upgrade each of those are strong opportunities for our region. They would be multi-billion dollar type of investments. Um, and so the, opp the opportunity is there. Demand growth for, for the value add products in each of those um, value chains. Demand growth is there globally. Demand growth is there in North America. And so uh, it always comes down to specific investor and company uh, comparisons of our jurisdictions to other jurisdictions and they look at everything. Capital cost, access to markets, feedstock, et cetera. But uh, yes, there's opportunities outside of hydrogen for sure. And then the next question is, is how do we as, as chambers of commerce, how do we take on a collaborative approach in investment within our communities? Um, so it's a, good, it's a good question. I think one thing I've seen, and I think is a really strong addition to the region, I know that the chambers have been involved is, is um, you know, collating uh, regional suppliers, uh, bringing them together in a forum to have uh, interface with some of the large companies operating in this region. I've seen that before. I think it was proposed before. I know uh, Fort Saskatchewan had proposed that. I think that's a very useful collaborative approach to demonstrate the breadth of supply chain and skills and, and companies that are in this region that can be showcased for potential, uh, either the companies that are here or new, new entrants. I think that's a, I've seen that before. I think that's actually a very useful and a very value add activity that I know the chambers have done in the past. That's a, that's a great answer. Thank you. That's, that's great. Uh, i got a couple more in the chat box here. The first one is, uh, can you explain a little bit more about how hydrogen is used as a fuel? Sure. Um, yeah, so so hydrogen as a fuel. So let's talk about it in, in terms of fuel cells for transportation, for example. So right now, um, vehicle, all of our internal combustion engines utilize, you know, gasoline or, or diesel. Um, there are, um, of course, the options for zero emission vehicles right now typically consist of electric vehicles or hydrogen fuel cells. So hydrogen fuel cells take hydrogen and uh, use that to convert to electricity, which then drives the drivetrain of a vehicle. So the idea of the hydrogen hub in this region would be to develop a network of hydrogen being the source of fuel. So when you go to a um, gas station or a, a distribution center, you'd be able to fill your hydrogen fuel cell vehicle up with hydrogen. And so hydrogen then would be used to drive the drivetrain of the vehicle as opposed to the internal combustion engine. So you're basically displacing 
gasoline or diesel with hydrogen. Hydrogen itself reacts with oxygen in the air. It forms, that's where the energy comes from um, when you're burning hydrogen for combustion, um, not in a fuel cell. So um, the calorific value associated with combining hydrogen with oxygen is what provides the energy. And then the emissions from that is H2O, which is water or water vapor. And that's why everyone's excited about it here. You get a tremendous calorific value from burning energy or combusting hydrogen, but you're left, the emission left with that is going to be H2O. So using fuel in vehicles as a fuel cell or in combustion in, in furnaces, uh, of course, the furnaces would need to be retrofitted to be able to support hydrogen. But that's my best non-technical answer to that question. Hope I didn't. That's actually, that was actually really well done, Mark. I, that, was, uh, you, you do, that was a very uh, complex subject that you navigated uh, in layman's terms quite successfully. So thank you. Um, did my best. Uh, do you anticipate or how do you anticipate the recent federal budget commitments? Uh, will, it, will it affect the investment traction uh, efforts? Uh, in particular, the CCUS tax credit and clean fuels fund. Yeah, so so the federal government have put money in the federal budget for support for CCUS. I think it was three hundred nineteen million dollars, if I'm not mistaken. That is not a huge amount of money, but it's something. It certainly signals something. And there's conversation. Um, the government indicated that they'll be having a ninety day um, consultation period to have a consultation around a carbon tax credit associated with CCUS. So, you know, anything's going to help. Of course, we have to compete with the, the Gulf Coast. So they have the 45Q tax credit on CCUS. Um, so it's going to help. I think 319 million is, is light. So additional monies will be there. The federal government have allocated significant dollars to, you know, um, helping industry transition, decarbonization, all of these things. So I think various programs will be designed. Um, so the problem, there may be other monies available for CCUS indirectly. Um, to answer the question, I think it's directionally helpful. I think 319 is probably light. That's it. Okay. Um, how do you anticipate uh, hydrogen and ammonia being transported to the coast for export? Uh, rail to start and then transition to dedicated pipelines once demand increases with the Alberta to Alaska Railway assist with this transportation once constructed? Yeah, so um, logistics on getting to Asian markets. I mean, we know the story here in Alberta, of course, getting our energy products to market is, is always a challenge. So the rail infrastructure is in place right now. And so the rail infrastructure, the the the, the, the port infrastructure needs to be constructed, but the rail infrastructure is there. So I think logically it would make sense in the short term that rail infrastructure would be utilized with new port infrastructure. Um, I think, I don't know. I mean, the A to A rail, I suppose could help. Um, that's a long ways away. I think, you know, in the long run, if volumes are high, the best economic, the safest and most economical way to transport energy products is in pipelines. So in the long run, I'd have to think that pipelines make the most sense. Whether or not they can be built is a separate conversation, but from an economic standpoint for large volumes and over the long term, pipelines would be, makes the most sense in the short run to get access to the market in the short run, the rail infrastructure is there. And I think that would be a logical way, assuming the total uh, cost makes sense for companies that are doing this. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, another question here uh, from uh, May Mayor Katcha. Mayor, did you want to to, to ask the uh, ask the question? Sorry, I. <laughs> Um, I, I guess I'd just like to know from Mark, uh, what more do we need? Uh, I'm going to say from the provincial government, because I know we struggle with the federal government, but what more can the provincial government uh, help us to do with business attraction or uh, in attraction, investment attraction? Yeah, th thanks for your question, Mary Catcher. Um, so first of all, the provincial government, um, you know, we... And, and as you know very well, um, we have worked, worked with them for a long time on the uh, what was the petrochemical diversification program and now the APIP. And the government has tweaked the um, incentive uh, landscape 
to come up with the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program. And that's a very strong program. Um, so the government really has come to the table with a very strong incentive program. You know, 12% of eligible capital, so maybe around 10% of total capital, that is provided to companies in the form of grants, which is, you know, it's not tax credits, it's not royalty credits, it's not anything like that, it's in the form of grants. Very strong support from the provincial government for the type of investments that we would see in Alberta. So, you know, the, the provincial government's done very well. Um, there's a few areas, I think, that the provincial government, and you had mentioned the federal government, where um, I think, you know, alignment or support or working with the federal government is where a lot of uh, help could be from the provincial government. And where we need help on the federal side um, would be things around, um, you know, there's uh, clarity is needed on the uh, SEPA Schedule 1 of the, the, the plastics uh, regulatory framework. That's an example. Um, um, you know, s putting additional, making additional awareness with the federal government around the regulatory framework for the natural gas, the NGTL system, uh, that TransCanada Energy um, manages um, so that we can ensure that we have timeliness of natural gas to new facilities. So I, I'm going to say in general, Mayor Catcher, you know, that alignment and, and working with the federal government to address some of the issues that are really at, in federal jurisdiction, because the provincial government has really done a lot, I think, uh, to, to try to help us achieve uh, investment here. And I, I'm just going to leave it at that for now, if you don't mind. Sounds good. Uh, the, a question here from Raj from NABI. Um, do you see opportunities for local startups, small businesses in the heartland to solve and provide solutions uh, to large corporations? Uh, sh sure. I think um, the companies operating here, um, they are looking for solutions for all sorts of problems. Um, I have a hard time answering that one. As you know, our, our focus is primarily dealing, working with international companies to get them to, 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 to understand our jurisdiction and invest in our jurisdiction. The companies operating here, though, um, are, you know, on a continuous improvement effort always, are always looking to uh, reduce costs, improve profitability, improve their uh, overall environmental footprint, uh, improve their social license, on and on. So I think um, there is always opportunity for local entrepreneurs to uh, provide, so help these companies provide solutions. But I can't say anything more specific than that because it's not exactly in our wheelhouse. No, that is, uh, that's fair. Um, I don't have any other questions in the chat. If anybody wants to put anything else in, we can. Uh... There may have been one, um... You may have already answered this, Mark. What is the total annual value of products sold out of the AIH, AIH uh, and what percentage uh, um, is export? Yeah, so I think it's in the, in terms of actual dollar amount, that's, I don't have that at my fingertips. I think around 80% of our products move out of the industrial heartland um, by rail. And it's probably between 80 and 90 move out of the heartland by export. Like most of the products in this, in the industrial heartland are made by export and they're gonna to go to the US market. Thank you. Ultimately. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions here. Um, so I am, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll, you know, th thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, always a pleasure that seemed, I was, I, I, it says here, uh, all the time we have for today, but we're a little shy, but that's, that's okay. Um, thanks so much to everyone who joined, especially Mark. Again, I appreciate you, uh, you, you going through the process with us. It, it's, it's very beneficial.